Welcome to Perspectives on Energy on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about residential rooftop solar and batteries. How does the excess energy from DERs impact grid reliability, and what can we do about it? Our co-host and guest for the show is Guillermo Sabache. Welcome, Guillermo. Thank you, Jay, so much for having me on. Uh, pleasure to be here. Well, storage hasn't kept up, and we need to know what effect that has on grid reliability, ultimately. And there's a whole sequence of things that happen. Uh, if you have lots of sun and lots of, lots of energy from solar, but then you don't have an, enough um, storage. So mm -hmm. can you talk about it and tell us what is happening and what is the effect on grid reliability of that scenario? And what are people doing about it? Of course, thank you. And, and one of the things we, we experienced is that there has been a shift from what used to be utility scale solar, which was a solar site owned by the utility that were big and there were a few certain sites and those had like a controlled rollout, right? When it comes to capacity and, and output. But in the last few years, you know, we, we've had an even bigger rollout at a more uh, granular level, but again, eventually that adds up and it has been rooftop solar. And that has been popular in areas where you have uh, usually, typically in areas where you have higher rates, higher electricity rates. So the residential customers are of course incentivized by doing this. Also, there was a time where uh, the utilities were giving out um, subsidies and financial incentives to actually put rooftop solar because everybody got into that business, including the utilities. And the challenge with that was that back then they would sell you the solar panels and give you all kinds of great financing, but they weren't really selling you anything for storage or the storage option was really expensive or worst of all, it wasn't even adequate, right? To actually store much of the excess. Now, you're seeing like a Tesla Powerwall, for example, that, that, that's something that they usually sell in tandem with a solar panel roof. And the same thing with the other with the other providers. It's just that, of course, that adds to the cost. Naturally, the utilities would always prefer you did solar with storage, right? But ultimately, what's, what's happened is that there's so much more solar than storage that uh, you're getting into a challenge of like excess energy in the middle of the day. And that curve has gotten far worse. It sounds to me like that was all predictable, that you could draw that curve a couple, three years ago and know that the, that curve was going to go in that direction. And yep. that means that uh, the people who were involved with storage uh, would have incentivized the storage that hasn't happened in Hawaii. Right. Uh, or at least it's happened only in minimal part. Um, and um, and the, by the same token, manufacturers and importers and, and governments in general um, to try to balance things. The word is balance, right? Um, if we could have anticipated this would happen, um, you know, the people involved should have worked the balance. No? In their defense, I have to say, I um, mean, heck, I even own a few of these batteries, right? There's lithium iron phosphate batteries, like LifePo. And those are far less expensive, far lighter, and far better than the lithium ion batteries, right? And I have a few of them. I use them for a trolling motor on a boat. I use them for, you know, when I go camping, I use them even as a backup in case one of the batteries goes dead in the cars. And these are the batteries that are now being preferred as the typical home energy storage solution, right? Usually LifePo uh, batteries, less dangerous, and they're a, a lot more available than the lithium ion batteries, right? So finally, the market's catching up and you're seeing a lot of that out there, but the problem is a, a one battery, it's a car car size battery of like 100 amp hours, 12 volt battery, that runs you about $200 on the average, each one. You need about eight of those, right, to really you know, make, a, make a significant impact when it comes to storing and then having, uh, having reliable source of the house. Forget about running air conditioner for very long, just enough to keep the lights on in your house, right? Some people buy a one, one, some, one a month, and they after a course of a year, they, they've actually built a pretty nice system. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's budgeting and planning, right? But with the incentives, right? There, I mean, there's something they could do on the incentives that would, you know, if you bring back the battery storage rather than solar, there will be a whole other, you know, capitalism will, 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 will chart a course through that, you know, through these waters, I think. It's just a little bit of, a little bit of a problem. Let me skip ahead of my slides so I can show you what that curve looks like. Because we've seen these slides before, and this is the system and demand curve, and this is one of interest, right? And sadly, this is my next to last um, slide. And what I'm showing here is what the famous duck curve looked like in 2015, right? And what you're seeing here is net load. 
and, and as you can tell, basically, back then we had solar, we had wind, we had all that good stuff. And 2015 is a, is a brownish looking graph out there in the, uh, let me see if I can draw on this thing. So th this graph here, right, was back in 2015. And as you can see back then, you'd have, you already had the impact of some of that solar, right? And then as the years went on, 2016 and 2022, where we're at, where we were in 2023 is this dark line over here. And all of this is approaching basically where your generation is now zero. So now your perceived load out there in the system appears to be zero. So when you have moments like these right here, you're looking at what they call negative load, which at some point, but the negative pricing happens way before you get down here, right? Because at some point, the economics of having units running, you know, say you got a regular generator burning natural gas, at some point, you have to begin to shut down your generators, right? Because you just cannot um, sustain a system. With that. And then once you have that happening, the prices change. Now, once you get down here, utilities will pretty much, uh, here, they're giving that away for free. Over here, they're paying people to take that power from them, which is negative pricing. So there is an imbalanced market in effect in, in many places, but often enough, you know, it, it's your neighbors already ha are already suffering the same problem. I was interested to see that if the utility shuts down because it goes negative and there's more energy out there than, you know, that they need or can handle, um, then um, have to, they have to bring it up again, say right. when the, the duck curve goes up at, at, at twilight time. Like right around um, here, right around here. Yeah. So what I what I find interesting is that the utility doesn't have the technology uh, to go down and come up on, on short notice that way, or, or at least in a short span of time. Um, and and that is the thing that makes the grid unreliable. Right. But couldn't they improve the technology? I mean, for example, in Hawaii, we, we have this uh, particular peak plant mm -hmm. uh, out, out on the west side of the island, and, and it's a peaking plant. And right, right. Um, the result is that Hawaiian Electric can bring it up on LNG very quickly, mm -hmm. very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it's, uh, it's seamless, I think. Right. So is there technology out there that would solve this reliability problem? Well, that, that peaking, th this peaking generation has been around for decades. The problem is that there's an inverse relationship where, where the quicker you get them on, the more expensive those units are. So, for example, uh, running running a, a combustion a combined cycle combustion turbine, which has two 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 turbines and then a, a heat recovery steam generator that captures the heat and is very efficient. Those run about I think it's about maybe three to eight dollar no, three three to eight cents a uh, no, three three to eight dollars a megawatt hour, right? When you look at these peakers, right, uh, they are basically $15, 20 $30 a megawatt. So they're very expensive to run. You're not going to run them for very long, which is why. But the, the interesting thing is that the peakers, the startup cost is really high. So a, uh, a, uh, if a unit is, um, again, it all depends on the tech, right? But usually shutting down units that are really meant to run, like, like for 24 hours or 12 hours, and you, and you shut them down two or three times a day, each shutdown runs between eight thousand to fifteen thousand hmm. dollars. So that that cost adds up, right? Also, you shorten the maintenance cycle, which now means your the wear and tears up the you know is 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 accelerated on that particular unit. Peakers are there for mainly for for actually for uh, disturbances. So say you lose generation, you need to have generation on very quickly before you black out. Well, these peakers will always save the day, and you got to have them, right? But again, they're very expensive, very expensive, and very to 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 operate, very expensive to start. And very expensive to maintain. So that's what happens. Is there another way to do it? Uh, I think it's um, uh, believe it or not, hydro. Uh, and, and again, that's geographically restricted. But hydro units, those dams, are amazing for this sort of thing because you can you can bring them to a complete stop, or you can turn them on and, and run them up all the way to like maximum load in like in, in very a very short amount of time, and their startup cost is near zero. Shutdown cost is near zero. But again, it's a very expensive upfront cost of, of uh, building these, these these facilities, right? But they're all over the country. So those are great. So is pump storage. They're really good at that. Um, the, the the other tech that we're also working on as an industry is really is, is, is battery storage, right? And that that is, is is becoming more and more popular. 
or deploy a role, they're easy to use. The other thing that we're seeing coming on as well is, is the, the, a lot of interest in small modular reactors. And now China is actually going to commission the very first one in 2025. So they're already going to do their, their, their commercial nation accepted design that they've all agreed on. So they're a little bit ahead of us in that regard, I think. So, But the, they're already ahead of the game and they're going to deploy it, which changes the geopolitical things because now if they can make it work there and they have that one design, what are they going to do with that thing? They're just not going to limit it to their own country. They're going to sell it to everybody, right? And it's not expensive. So. What would you prefer, um, battery storage or nuclear? I prefer a mix. So battery storage has its uses. And, 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 and you know, it's right there. It's, it's right right at, at, at our fingertips. You have all these like uh, electric vehicles in many places. And those can easily double as energy storage, given the right the right protocol and the automaker agrees, the utility coordinates. I mean, there's a lot of coordination, there's a lot of software that needs to go into that, but it's it's not difficult to do. It's already there. It's already been beta tested. So that's one example, battery storage, right? Using EVs, mm -hmm. using, what, using a whole rack of batteries. I mean, either solution works in the house. The other solution from the utility scale is of course those small modular reactors, I think. And that, that is, I mean, we're, we're a few years away from that, I think, but that's going to be a solution that I think will probably meet all our carbon uh, emissions needs to pretty much bring that down to zero and then combine that with batteries. And then, of course, you're going to have your occasional, you know, quick start peak or combustion turbines, you know, if, if things get really dire or you, or you have a really bad situation. Like right now in California, all this like haze and smoke has really diminished their uh, solar output. You don't have that uh, much, you know, irradiance. Uh, so it has an impact as well. One thing I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. in, in thinking about the subject here today. So we say that if we have too much supply from solar and not enough uh, storage to deal with it, to hold it, um, and that creates grid um, you know, reliability issues, how, how does that translate into uh, daily grid supply? What, what, is, what do you mean when you say a failure of grid reliability, what happens? When you have, there's a, a system inertia, which is basically a lot of generators spinning together at the same frequency, all that mass, rotating mass is out there in the system. When you begin to remove a lot of that and you just have these like solar sites with their inverters doing a synthetic AC 60 Hertz signal, they don't react as well or as robustly when you have, for example, a, uh, a transmission disturbance happening. What's a, what is that? Well, that could be, for example, fires under a transmission corridor. Those fires, that smoke gets up on those lines, and eventually those lines will actually have an arc and they'll fault. Those lines have to open up out of service, and they may come back into service momentarily, automatically. They may not, but during all this time, all those solar facilities may react in a way that they either stop output or they shut off completely for 5, 10 minutes, which California's already suffered that years ago. As a result of that, they changed a lot of what they call the write-through characteristics and being able to like, they make them hold on a little longer, but that can also damage the equipment, right? At these uh, solar sites with the inverters and all that stuff. So, whereas the machines spinning around were a lot more resilient and, and, and were able to withstand instability a, a little better, so. When you say damage the equipment, uh, uh, you're talking about the utility transmission equipment that you, the yes. equipment the utility is operating but what yes, about yes. you know the secondary effect of um, damaging equipment in the home that's a really interesting thing so what happens is most um solar and and of course battery storage in the house they if they're if they have a smart throw over panel what they'll do is if you only have solar it'll just immediately stop producing solar because if, if you black out or you have a problem your your solar system is not going to try and supply a dead system, right? So it'll just immediately shut, shut down. So not only have you lost supply from the utility side, you lost supply from the distribution customer side. If you have battery storage, it's gonna be the same thing. It'll just basically try and supply it, you know, the house and it'll maintain supplying the house. If you have a smart system that'll basically cut off the disconnect from the grid and just stay, for example, uh, self-sustaining. Depends on the design, depends on what you purchase. Some of them just, cut off altogether. So the ideal system would just basically just, uh, hey, you're, it's like basically cranking up a generator, right? You're running as long as the batteries are there and you're supplying what you can out of the solar. 
But if you have too much load on those solars, those solars will also kick off. They're, they'll, they'll come offline too. Like you can't run your air conditioner just so. So as a solution to this problem, this uh, imbalance problem, if you will, um, at the utility end of things, or is it at the homeowner end of things? Uh, and I'm, uh, I guess I'm, I guess I'm talking about people with solar and people without solar. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, who does what um, to ameliorate the risk? Who does what to change the equipment, change the systems to, as to avoid the imbalance? It is definitely going to take a partnership approach. So it's going to have to be a partnership with, between the utilities, not just one utility, but several utilities. It's going to have to have a standard protocol, a, a best practices. It's going to have to be a partnership with the manufacturers to, to be able to comply with that standard and protocol. And it's going to have to be the consumer, right? That there actually is, or the prosumer, which is owning these uh, these solar site, solar solar rooftops and energy storage devices, right? Because ultimately, they have to be coordinated. Because uh, they're in this situation in in our in our graph right here, at the very bottom. All that solar has to work its way up the up the circuits from the house all the way up through the, the through those like distribution circuits all the way up to the substation and back into the transmission system. So flow is going in the other direction, to the point that a lot of the different settings, a lot of the different protection systems, a lot of the different uh, sensors and controls have to be adjusted and and even like tested to make sure they can handle faults going the other way, because they're not going to behave correctly at that point. Usually they always assume power flows radially from like source down to the down to the to the load, especially in the distribution circuit. So it's going to have to be an entire the, the level of cooperation, coordination and partnership will be much, much greater than what we see today. And, and in some places we're getting there, their uh, utilities are, are, are getting ahead of it by setting up uh, systems and protocols and software and equipment to monitor and control all this. And others are just lagging behind. So it all depends on how their market is doing and what 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 initiatives they take in their own systems. What can state governments do about this, Guillermo? State governments, what what I've noticed is that they they need to either incentivize rather than try and dictate. When you try and dictate, what uh, what I notice, it, it, it's not always it's not always the right people making the decisions. And and if you incentivize, for example, grid grid reliability ahead of climate goals, but you always make that in partnership right, with, with, the, with the climate goal, then I think we will get there a lot quicker. And really, is the, the utilities don't care where the energy comes from. They want to be able to supply their customers with reliable power. The producers are the ones that, you know, that care more about that. But in reality, hey, they want to be able to sell power to the utilities, and the utilities are dictating, well, we don't want this kind of power because a lot of it is cost. They want to be able to buy power at a lower cost and it's reliable. And the transmission providers want to have the space to be able to move all this power from one place to another. So, so um, the Department of Energy is really involved in this, and and they're 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 applying standards, they're applying a lot of work towards making this happen, and they have a very uh, helpful approach. But but at the uh, we have to be careful when we have state and local governments trying to mandate certain goals when they don't really have they haven't invited all these stakeholders to the conversation. Suppose I'm a battery manufacturer, mm -hmm. and I see this. I see this need. I see the discussion that we're having today, this imbalance, and I say, "Gee, I, I, I have the ability to fix that. A, I can make more efficient batteries that you know that that don't cost that much to start and stop. Uh, B, I can make more batteries, make larger batteries, and so forth. And I, I surmise from what you're saying that." We haven't done that. The industry, the battery industry, hasn't done that. I'm not sure where the batteries come from, or what uh, scarce materials they use mm -hmm. um, to, you know, make those batteries. But it seems to me that if somebody was Akamai about this, um, they would make bigger, better, faster, cheaper batteries that would interest utilities and would go beyond what did you refer to the Tesla wall kind right. of battery. Right. Um, for the homeowner, and that if we had lots of batteries, if we were swimming in big batteries, then that would solve the problem. But no, the industry is not meeting that demand. Am I right? It's a supply, right? So, so right now, there the cost is rather prohibitive, right? Initially, and and because in order to have batteries, you got to set up an inverter, a charger, and then hey, you can have batteries without 
so solar, it's fine because if you have a power outage, your batteries will then kick in and then you use that to, to supply your house. That will also work, but the batteries are rather expensive. So, and batteries will solve many aspects of this problem, but they won't be the only solution to this problem. Right? You have a variety of things. So the, the batteries will be a big part of the solution, but they won't be the only solution, I think. Mm. Um, because it's going to be a race between, at the utility scale, between uh, utility scale storage and small modular reactors or some other kind of generation that, that is quicker and cheaper. And then at the residential level, the DERs, uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that you know, hey, can we get them? Can, can we get them to, to to sell batteries that are that are more efficient, more reliable, that last longer? Because the other thing, a, a certain number of cycles, right? Life pull batteries are way better, but you know, most insurance providers have it. You know, they lose their minds when they hear you're installing a power wall, right? Because now it's like now you're at a greater fire risk. So that's the other challenge. And in Florida, for example, you're putting solar panels on your roof. Now they're going to lose their minds because now you you essentially uh, have installed a giant wind sail on your roof. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a bunch of different things that need to work together in here to make this really work and, and get us through this. So who is manufacturing this stuff? Um, now I recall that the Chinese were very interested in competing with us on uh, yeah, they're, they're, manufacturing. Go ahead. Well, yeah, there's the the... The smaller batteries for the for the for the residential consumer, most of them are being sourced out of China. The larger ones, the utility scale solar, those are made domestically. Uh, but again, they're being made all over the world. The hard part is getting all of that raw material, right? It's so that race to get lithium and aluminum and those other other like uh, elements or metals to actually make this work is what's really you know constricting the whole the, the whole process. And really, it's 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 the and then mining it and refining it and getting it out there. And, that in itself has a lot of like waste and, 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 and impact on climate as well. So doing that correctly and cleanly and and, a, and, and they're they're not all being sourced out of like you know one country. They're, they're they're different parts of the world. So so you also have to make accommodations for that and understand you know what the cost is when it comes to that and logistics and all that. But yeah, it's it's usually China that's doing the whole lithium iron phosphate batteries. And then it's all the other like seven types of batteries that at the utility scale, they're all being produced mostly domestically here. But those are larger batteries for What about cobalt? Is cobalt part of the uh, the battery it technology is, these days? Is, that's another battery type. And again, it's, it's, it's a challenge, right? When it comes to sourcing that raw material as well. So some places we have it here in some cases, other places it's, it's, it's mined in, in different parts of the world. So just a matter of securing the securing that source, that resource, and then being able to hang on to it while the mine still has enough, enough of it. Because eventually uh, you can dig a mine dry and then you got to move on, right? So. I remember, Guillermo, uh, not too many years ago, three, four years ago, um, there was an issue about cobalt in the Congo, which was a big mm -hmm. supplier of cobalt. And there was a company there, an American company, that, that had sort of monopolistic control over the mines from which the cobalt was being mined in, in the Congo. And you know that, that, of course, leads to geopolitical issues. You have to have a good relationship with the government of the Congo and all that. But one day, the Chinese walked in, mm. and they bought the mine from the American company, which was a capitalistic you know, country, company, mm. uh, that was um, you know, interested in selling for the right price. So mm. now the Chinese controlled this mine for cobalt. Uh, in the U.S. And I think it was uh, Joe Biden made a big mm, diplomatic push uh, mm -hmm. to get control back again to an American company so that we could have the cobalt. And I think he succeeded. That's, that's my recollection of it. Do you know right. about this? Yeah, that and I think what he did was he got that, that, that government there to actually, because what they also had were, were they, they had these like, I'm not sure what the details are, but there was some kind of like, interesting interesting lending that was going on not just in the mine but other parts of, the, of that country and yes that that's one example where we regain control but the thing the problem with that mine was that we had already extracted what we were going well that company had already extracted what it needed out of that mine so remaining there at the time given the demand of cobalt at the time wasn't worthwhile for them from a business standpoint which is why they sold 
Now, on yeah. the other side of that spectrum is you remember what happened when the war in Ukraine started and then all of a sudden France was in, had some conflict with four nations in Africa that allied themselves against France. You go, well, that's because those four countries were, as, as were most of, most of the uranium ore that France was, was, was acquiring was from those countries. And France, and they wanted better terms with France when it came to, 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 to the mining of the, of the, the, the market behind this. Now, France naturally needed a lot more uranium because, of course, France was not just buying its own load, but it was selling power to Germany and the rest of Europe because France is mostly nuclear, whereas Germany was now almost completely uh, reliant on Russian gas for its uh, generation. So geopolitical problems again, right? Yes. Well, talk to us some more about your slides, Guillermo. So, so on the next slide here, this is an interesting display here on what we see right, regarding California's rooftop solar installations and, and how, they, how they've, they, they've increased the number of those, right? And this is basically in, in gigawatts, right? So, so it's, it's 1,000 watts. So in, as you can see, there's been a pretty steady r rise and it's pretty consistent up until 2023, 2024. So from 2024, I can highlight here. So there was always a a, a rather um, rather steady increase, and it was pretty linear at this point. And then it, it jumped up to 2023, and then towards the very end, and here between 2023 and 2024, there hasn't been much of a change, right? So it, it's kind of flattening out, and that has to do with the fact that you know they pretty much suspended all the subsidies and incentives at the state level. Right? Which you know, but that was done not because they ran out of money, but because really it, it, it was starting to pose a reliability problem in that case. So you can see what's happened here. But again, fifteen distributed solar, so fifteen thousand megawatts. That is the size of a rather large utility, mind you. That's capacity. That doesn't mean they can produce that power twenty-four hours a day. It just means for those four, four or six hours of the day they can produce that amount of power on a sunny day. But it's still a lot. It is a lot of power to, to have that you know installed capacity out there in solar. So again, when it comes in, it's a lot, and then when it goes away, it's a lot because then then you have to like start all those peakers. Those peaking units actually be able to handle that whole what they call the, the lighting peak, which is when the sun sets and then everybody turns on all their lights and people start cooking and all sort of things. So. So yeah, so you see here the, the, that that rather flat from one year to the next when it comes to uh, solar capacity in the states. It doesn't sound real positive to say that uh, it went flat. Um, don't we no. want a, a constant increase in solar capacity? Uh, what, what does this mean for for green energy renewables? It's a really good question. I think what you're seeing here is that we're finally hit what they call the renewables knee with solar, and now we're going to we're going to shift. I think we're going to shift more to batteries and storage, at least at the distribution, at the distributed uh, energy resources level. So now you're going to see more and more storage. So now what you're going to see is probably uh, there's going to be a, a curve that's going to start here somewhere, and you can see it start increasing as well when it comes to battery storage. That's what I hope to see. That's what I think we will see. Again, depends on the, uh, the capitalism behind it, the incentives, and, of course, how the markets react, right? But I think the customers will be ready for that because there's nothing better than actually storing this power and then, you know, using it to the point that not only are you like your bill is basically zero at some point, but you're able to now sell power back to the utility that you had it on storage. Are you saying that uh, the cost of storage and hopefully, you know, this will decrease over time, but is the cost of storage more or less than the cost of uh, solar panels on your rooftop? But I think for the installed unit, because it's measured differently, but but it, it, it's per unit of energy, it's, it's, it's more expensive, way more expensive. It's almost like a, an order of magnitude more expensive than solar panels at this stage. Mm. Mm. But then again, panels used to be prohibitively expensive 10, 12 years ago. So now you can get a panel for like less than, you know, less than $100 when you have like a, a two foot by four foot panel, which is the, what the majority of them are sized in. So. You remember the Deacon's Chariot Guillermo, the deacon had a chariot, and he was really tired of his uh, wagon breaking down all the time. So he took the time to build a very special chariot that was going to last 100 years. And he made sure that every aspect of this chariot was 
first class. And it did. It lasted 100 years. And then everything broke on the same day. Okay. And I mentioned this. Be <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure that's on the uh, Internet somewhere. <clears throat> I mentioned this because if the country, the world is putting in all these uh, solar panels, uh, however reliable or not reliable they are from whatever source they come and and they have a useful life of I'm guessing here, but say 20 years, let me mm -hmm. pick that number. Then at the end of 20 years, going to have this huge failure. Um, and do you see a failure like that coming, you know, simply because of the useful life? Um, and, and if and when that happens, what do we do? So that's a very good question. And you know what? Now I'm going to use that example, by the way, in every class I teach, the, the Deacon's Cherry is great. So I, what happens with panels over time is that they begin, it's, it's not like a sharp decrease in their efficiency or their output. It's like a, it, it's like a slow march, you know, towards death over time, right? And they're, they still produce power. In fact, there's a whole market, right? I think in in Africa or in other third world countries where those panels that that are beyond the useful life, they still have enough uh, output to be viable in some areas where the demand isn't as high, and they resell them and install them over there, usually through some uh, nonprofits. So you, you're still going to have output out of these panels. It just won't be as great as when they were uh, new, five years old, or even ten years old. But with that in mind, I think that's where energy storage at the residential level will have its time to shine. And how does that work? Well, ultimately, you will have uh, some some storage that's gonna that's gonna happen during that time. You may not get the output you had when you first got them, but there's so much in the system out there that you will somehow, one way or another, store some of that energy. And you may not use all of it. You may be relying more on the uh, on what's being supplied by the utility. But at the same time, you'll, you'll see a more of that happening. And I think the energy storage will slightly offset that whole collapse. My concern really is that after like a good 20, 25, 30 years, those panels, right, they're not going to be as efficient. And then they're going to, you're going to have new stuff coming out in the market where you're going to be more tempted to or, or encouraged to go ahead and change that. So what's going to happen to these old panels environmentally? Where are they going to end up? How are they going to, how are they going to be processed? And, and that's also a major concern, right? The, 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 env the environmental impact of this uh, waste. So hopefully those get repurposed, reused, reprocessed, upcycled. Mm. Yeah. So, Let me add one other, uh, one other factor to, to the broth over here, and that is the Puerto Rico effect. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Puerto Rico, there were, there were a number of utility scale solar farms out there. Um, but when that Maria was it Maria happened, Maria. okay, there were there were two results uh, from that extreme weather. In in the case of one of those farms, uh, I don't know how many there were, but let's just say there were two kinds. Mm -hmm. In the case of one of those farms, they had used a certain kind of fastener to fasten the panels to the rooftops or to the stands, mm -hmm. um, and and they used a different fastener on the other one. Um, and one of those fasteners was better. And right. so what happened is that the panels on the, um, the, the, less, the less robust uh, mm -hmm. stands, the less robust fasteners, blew away. And the, and the farm, the solar farm was destroyed. Uh, on the other kind of fastener, it, it stood fast. The reason I mention this is that it's a factor going forward. We have climate change with extreme weather. Uh, we have windstorms coming and God knows what. Um, and so that it's a factor that, that has to be considered. And I, I don't know the level of technology about fastening the solar, the solar panels to the rooftops. Uh, is there a, is there a di direction on that? Is this something of concern? That has always been the concern in Florida and places that are impacted by severe weather, basically anywhere in the path of hurricanes, the Caribbean, Florida, on that area. And... I know that building code requires a certain type of fastener. I know that insurance, along with the building code, enforce that because of the fact that you know, you, you you incur a loss that involves a solar panel flying around and the damage to your roof. Then you know they're going to make sure that, that the fastener that you had there met that you know that minimum requirement. So yeah, so so that that really comes down to the whole you know, proper building code on a residential side. On the industrial side, there's also like uh, IEEE and ISO standards. That require a certain level of fastener, fastener uh, um, robustness, right? When it comes to handling that, 
But no, it is a very good, good and, and important aspect of that. Whereas in fast food in the past, right, they didn't have that that kind of like uh, that kind of research, right, put into them. And and we saw that in Puerto Rico. We seen that a little bit in Florida as well. And so some of the hurricanes and those uh, distributor energy resources that suffered, like flying panels. I know we skipped a lot of your slides, Guillermo. I, I want to offer you a little time here to uh, try to catch up on that. After all, the, the, the study of, of energy is so often a catch up, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah it, is. it really is. And some of these slides we saw earlier was basically is the, 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 the typical demand curve. And I think we've seen the same slide in uh, some, some of our previous shows where we're, we're basically looking at uh, we're looking at what happens right through through the day. And in this case, we're looking at uh, what happens early in the morning, you know, 6 a.m. and then 10, 9 a.m. And this is really like an older curve, right? Because here we, you have to take it into account the deeper um, like effect of solar. So as you can see here, right, like, like you have different units operating at different levels. And once you get to this peak over here, you may supply your load, but you also have to have enough of a margin to handle, for example, the loss of your largest unit. So this requires having units that are available and also supplying power. So the higher up you go on this particular graph, the more expensive per unit of energy these, um, these devices are. So of course, they're, they're, they're highly dispatchable. It's, it's like running a nice, really efficient bus versus driving a really fast, maneuverable like sports car. So your, your cost per mile is gonna be a lot more, very different. Problem is that stopping, this is like, Trying trying to stop a very cheap uh, train or cruise ship, right? On a dime, you just can't do that. So as you get deeper and deeper on this curve, right, you're having to shut down some of these units that are a lot more difficult to shut down and a lot more expensive. And eventually, down here is the uh, right now we're seeing nuclear plants, and in some parts of the country, they're dispatching them day ahead. So if they expect a lot of sun and you have a lot of wind and solar coming in the next day. They will tell that nuclear plant to kind of like hold off and then back off and then come back up again at a certain time. You can do that quickly with a nuclear plant? No, no. Nuclear plant requires almost 24 hours notice here in the U.S. I mean, we, they need a lot of lead time. And, and, the, and that's a big deal for a nuclear plant. For a long time in that nuclear industry, you would just set the plant at one level and it would stay there for 18 months because of the cost and the nuclear and, and the wear and tear and the required maintenance cycle. And now they're dispatching some of them, you know, from if, if I know tomorrow is going to, going to be a certain load, I'll tell the nuclear plant, hey, tomorrow between the hours of like 10 and say four, you need to back down your output by like 40 percent. Right Now, that also is a really bad problem financially because nuclear plants historically have been a lot really inexpensive compared to, to everything else you got going on. The, the, the other issue is that you, you, a nuclear plants cannot turn on a dime. They're, they're very hard to like maneuver. So it requires a lot of planning. Now, France does this a lot more with all of their units, and they actually have them responding to like load and, and, and changes. But again, the wear and tear of those units is, is, is a lot greater. And they have a different, they have a lot more different designs and they're in our, they don't have, their agencies are a little different than ours, for example. So here we tend to stick to one type of design, whereas over there they have a few others that are more maneuverable. But again, not as cost effective. You know, Guillermo, it strikes me from this discussion mm -hmm. that the U.S. and HSI and you are, are really mm, drilling down on the technology of integrating all the systems mm -hmm. and doing predictions with the best software. Probably AI is helping mm -hmm. or could help on this sort of thing. And, um, you know, generally mm, balancing the best we can. And I just wonder if the level of um, analysis, the level of integration that we are doing, that you are doing in this country uh, is matched anywhere else. I mean, uh, so France has a certain amount of nuclear capacity, uh, maybe other places too. The um, uh, question is, are we ahead of other countries? Are we ahead of Europe uh, in terms of integrating all these resources? I think we're at parity. It's just that Europe has a lot of a lot of different rules, and they're experiencing a certain problems. So as we saw, that became clearly evident during the whole Ukraine crisis. Right for them, they, that, that that really exposed the soft underbelly of what's going on with them. 
So they didn't have a very good diversified portfolio and they were really focused on certain things that really like uh, became a problem for them under that, you know, and of course they weren't planning on that happening. They were, they were depending on, on certain supply, but that was an issue here. Uh, we're trying an approach where we're, we're trying to agree on a design for example, for, for the whole SMRs, which they're hoping is going to be the answer to all these challenges. But when it comes to studying this, everybody's really concerned with the effect of distributed energy resources. Uh, right now, we're not even near where we're going to be in like five, five, six years, where basically everything is flowing back. Um, the utilities eventually are going to be able to, to curtail, for example, your rooftop solar output, because if they got nowhere to put it, they're going to curtail them. And that's really mm -hmm. where we're headed. Now, ideally, if you have solar, uh, solar and storage, and the utility will pay you, hey, just hang on to these, uh, in your case, kilowatt hours, hang on to these, and then we're gonna use them later. And then you hang on to those, I'll be able to run my plant and avoid having to shut it down. And then when the lighting peak happens, you know, hey, we're all gonna work on this together and we're gonna have a more reliable afternoon, day after day. And that's really where we're headed. My concern with that is it's a lot of bandwidth of communications, a lot of processing power that's required, and we have it, my problem with that is going to be the cybersecurity aspect of that particular of all those systems. So much happening, so many concerns, so many possibilities. Uh, and P.S. Uh, you mentioned um, you know uh, power in Ukraine. Uh, I'd be very interested at some point, uh, Guillermo, of discussing Zaporizhia and uh, the nuclear situation in Ukraine and what right. has happened to it and how it affects other parts of Europe. Anyway, we're out of time. And I think we'll have to leave it there. Um, thank you very much, Guillermo Sabatier of HSI. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Thanks for watching. Aloha.